I would like also to read from Rays of the One Light, today's reading, thank you, which is on activity versus inner communion. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. Last week we contemplated the well-known story of Martha and Mary. Traditionally, this story has been offered to show the two classic approaches to salvation, the first through action and the second through prayer. The excuse of the Marthas of this world has always been the Church needs its Marthas too. Treatises, moreover, have been written to justify the Martha approach to piety, praising her self-sacrifice as perhaps an even higher demonstration of devotion. Thus do unmeditated people in religion try to justify themselves. Yet the fact remains that Jesus rebuked Martha. Elsewhere, moreover, he spoke of the virtue of feeding the hungry, curing the sick, and housing those who were homeless. It wasn't that he disapproved of serving people. Wrong attitude was the object of his criticism. What he was criticizing was forgetfulness of the true goal of right spiritual action. Good deeds outwardly without inner communion with God will result in good karma, but will not bring final freedom from all karma. The path to inner freedom was described by Paramahansa Yogananda in these words, Be always calmly active and actively calm. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, he who is not shaken by anxiety during times of sorrow, nor related during times of happiness, who is free from egoic desires and their attendant fear and anger, such an one is of steady discrimination. Do your duty in life, so counsels this great scripture elsewhere, but never lose sight of him to whom all action should be dedicated. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. <coughs> Thank you all for coming to celebrate my birthday, which is really not a very important event in the great scheme of things, but to me it means one step closer to getting out of it all. <laughs> you know, when you reach my age, you have a tendency to reminisce, and I lack the three basic props for this kind of reminiscence. I don't have a porch. <laughs> I don't have a rocking chair. And I don't have a pipe. I think the purpose for the pipe is to make people know you're still aware. As long as you can puff, you're still conscious. <clears throat> but in fact, it is interesting to look back a little bit and see uh, where I've come to the extent that it can be helpful to other people. Because as I'm told Terry was talking yesterday, and it was a very good point to bring out, the first thing I did in writing for Master was the, uh, <clears throat> what we now call out of the labyrinth that was then called Crises in Modern Thought. So let me reminisce just a little bit, because when I was a boy I wanted to be a playwright and there were a number of people who thought I would be a front-ranking playwright and I had a lot of encouragement in that direction, but I had another quality that uh, made it impossible to be a playwright, self-honesty. I wanted to bring people truth. And I said, I don't know truth. Why should I dump my ignorance on other people? So I thought, well, I just have to leave it. <coughs> there was another thing, too. 
And I think in light of, for example, our Festival of the Arts that we're coming up to, and last night's performance, which was really wonderful. Art has always been a very important part of my life, but I looked at the scene and I thought, even someone like Shakespeare, he's, yes, he's been beautiful, he's inspired people with beauty, but what has he done to really change anything? Very little, except if you see it in the larger context of a search for truth, of the refinement of civilization, <coughs> excuse me, the arts in that larger context are important. But if we make them a god in themselves, they are not important. They're a false god. This is what I kept running up against when I was in college, that people kept making a deity of poetry and painting. And, and I saw that the more they did it, the more they produced god-awful stuff. It was just awful. <laughs> And I realized that unless we tie what we're doing, and this is what Jesus was saying to Martha, tie what you're doing to the divine consciousness. We have to feel God's presence in what we do. We have to see, this is really the essence of wisdom, to see it in connection with a larger consciousness, to see everything in its connection to a larger consciousness. This is wisdom. And to recognize that uh, whatever we do, if we can think of it in terms of expressing the divine. You know, I don't know how many of you, but I imagine many, if not most of you, have read the uh, letters of Brother Lawrence. They're beautiful letters. And he made it a point from the beginning of his spiritual path to constantly think of God. Uh, there's another book that I highly recommend, Letters of a Modern Mystic by Frank Laubach. He had a beautiful thing. He said, don't think of God in the third person. Think of him as you and talk to him all the time. Try to include him in everything that you do. Every time you wonder, should I do this or should I do that? Don't just ask yourself, ask him. You'll find that that practice gradually brings about a habit and it becomes natural for you to feel his presence, to feel guidance, and to see that again and again that guidance is true. Now you can't be presumptuous. It's very easy for the human mind to err. It's sort of like somebody at the horse race says, um, well, God, whatever you want, but I put my money on this thing. Let's hope it wins. Come on, ha, 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 let's see it win. And so your desires get into it, and you sort of push for one particular solution. You've got to have no attachment at all. This is what happened with me. I really gave up all attachment to wanting to write. I thought there's no point in it. If I can't, if I don't know truth, what can I teach to others? The solution most people find is, and this is why I brought in the thought of honesty, <coughs> most people find their solution in being so vague that nobody knows what they're talking about, but they figure it must be deep. <coughs> you read a lot of writing, and it has just that kind of expression that, um, in fact, I was recently given a book that is supposedly, I frankly doubt it, but anyway, the claim of the publishers is that they've sold five million copies. Well, I mean, if people are that stupid, okay, but hard to believe. The idea of it is you can open it at any particular page and p sentence and ask yourself, what is it really saying? It's all sort of beautiful, vague stuff that you can't quite pin down, and therefore it must be deep. I'm sure you've read books like that. I remember a book by Dane Rudyard, who was very famous as an astrologer back in the 70s. Whether he's still famous, I don't know. But uh, one thing that made him famous was that he had this kind of thinking. And there was one paragraph there that I, I read about 10 times before I finally said, I didn't know it didn't mean anything. <laughs> It ought to have meant, but it somehow didn't. <laughs> well, I wasn't satisfied with that kind of thinking, and so I couldn't, I didn't want to, um, 
I didn't study script, scripture because I thought everybody talks about God without knowing him. What's the use? I just didn't know what to do. And then I came upon a book of my mother's, the Short World Bible. And in this, I read excerpts. And when I came upon the excerpts from the Hindu scriptures, I was thrilled for two reasons. One is that it was so down to earth. It related to life as you know it. Another is it didn't pigeonhole truth. It spoke of cosmic truth, which I believed in. Truth can't be something that is just locked in one church. It can't even be all worldwide. It has to be the whole universe. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's, that's for me. And I remember it said that if you want to know me, meditate. So I sat there and tried to meditate. I didn't know what I was doing, but I did the best I could, sort of sitting cross-legged on my bed. And I was, when I came back to New York, I was putting my mother on the ship to go to join my father in uh, Cairo, Egypt, where he was posted. And uh, <clears throat> after I put her on the ship, I read this, I found this book in, the, in a bookstore in New York, Autobiography of a Yogi. That book just, it was a revelation. And you know, I mean, when you make sudden changes in life, they usually don't mean very much. They're usually, they're emotional and you sort of feel this way today and feel that way tomorrow. I took the next bus from New York to Los Angeles. That's a long trip, four days and four nights. And I came to Master, and the first words I said to him were, I want to be your disciple. And never for one moment since that time in 1948 have I ever had the slightest change of heart. I've had many doubts, but I always knew this was my way. He was my teacher. And I saw one thing in him that was absolutely charming that he made everything so simple. As I say in the path, he wore his wisdom like a comfortable old jacket. He didn't offer wise, profound, absolutely incomprehensible pronouncements. He spoke simply. He brought truth down to your level where you could understand it. And if you didn't, he tried to help you to understand it. And if you still said, I don't understand, he'd still try. He didn't say, well, it's your problem. His whole life was spent trying to find ways of getting a truth so clear that people would say, oh, yes, of course. It was thrilling to me. I said, this is what I really want to get behind. And uh, he told me one day that your life is writing and lecturing. And there was a lot of... of uh, sort of resistance in me to both of those things. I, I just wanted to be a gardener, forget about all that stuff. But uh, I told him several times, I said, I, sir, I don't want to lecture. One time he said, you'd better learn to like it. It's what you've got to do. But uh, in writing, he told me to write. I said, well, sir, what can be said beyond what you've said? What else is there to talk about? You've explained your teachings. I was surprised. He said, don't say that. Much more is needed. But all I could see was the profundity of his work, his words, his, his uh, ideas. I didn't see what to do in addition to that. And so for years, I never really got into writing. But I wrote little pamphlets and so on for the church, but nothing serious. Until one day in India, I was reading the USIS, that means the US, United States Information Service magazine called SPAN. And in that, there was an article on the thoughts of modern times, the thoughts that have led up to modern times, the teachings of Sartre and of all these other people in our Western society that have caused people to conclude that there is no meaning in life that everything being relative has no particular validity and that all, um, 
all spiritual belief is just nonsense. And I thought, well, look, Master's teachings answer every one of these thoughts. He didn't answer them himself, but his teachings do. And I thought, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to spend some time really getting into that subject to show how the insights that he brought answer every one of those dilemmas. And it was only a month later that I was thrown out on my ear from SRF. And if I had known it, because all my life was absolutely dedicated to that work. But uh, it wasn't God's will for me. I had something else I had to do. And I knew what that was, too. This made it possible for me to really sit down and start doing the research for Crises in Modern Thought, which, as I said, is now called Out of the Labyrinth. And I lived in San Francisco, and I went to the library, the public library, and studied all these writers. And it was very hard work because, you know, if you are set in a way of thinking very strong, you see the logic of it, you see the clarity of it, it makes such perfect sense. Then you see coming in and waving a flag and say, wait a minute, this is the truth, not that. And you feel like just dismissing him as an absolute idiot. That was my temptation. And I realized I couldn't do that because if I wrote a book saying they're just a bunch of hogwash, nobody would listen to me. So I had to go into that camp of the enemy, you might say, in the sense that they represented ideas that I had dedicated my life to combating. And so in reading those things, I had to go in trying to see things from their point of view. It took a lot of willpower, I have to admit. Always hanging on to what I knew, but trying to see their point of view, trying to see how obviously intelligent people would come up with such nonsense. And bit by bit, I came to see that I could use their own arguments and turn them around. One marvelous triumph I had in that. There was all the teaching that I found, <clears throat> again pointed out by this article in Spen. It was the head of the philosophy department in, at MIT who wrote the article. I don't remember his name. But uh, he was saying that the whole teaching of evolution proves that there is no consciousness, that all life is just a, a sort of a uh, automatic push-me-pull-you kind of reaction from inert matter. And I thought, well, this is a real challenge. I've got to get into this. I can't allow... <coughs> I can't allow people to say, well, you don't know what's going on. I had to know the answer so that I could answer it. And so I studied J.C. Bush, which of course we all know from Autobiography of a Yogi. And I studied the, the uh, different people like Bonhoeffer and so on, who really pretty well proved that the reactions of metals are the same as the reaction of nerve tissue, that there really isn't a difference between consciousness and unconsciousness, that, it, that you can make a good case for everything being conscious, or unconscious, I mean. The only flaw in that particular argument is that you have to use consciousness to make that argument. <laughs> in other words, it's self-defeating. It's ridiculous. And I said, well, look, okay, I accept. Unlike most ministers and people who defend religion and so on, don't say, no, it can't be, or we haven't yet discovered all the truth, and so someday we'll prove that this is right and consciousness is the sole thing and so on. All those people really accept matter as a separate reality. I said, why make it separate? Why not just pull back a little bit? And this is what Jesus was counseling Martha too. The attitude of a little bit of withdrawal in everything that you do. Don't dive headfirst into it. This is what I did when I decided I, I don't have what it takes to be a writer. I don't have what it takes to share an understanding I don't have. So I withdrew. And a master taught that also. Hold back a little bit. Think, what does it really mean? And I saw, well, look, it's self-evident. If matter and consciousness are the same thing, 
We can argue that consciousness is matter, but that doesn't make any sense at all. We can also argue that matter is conscious. And that makes a great deal of sense. If you consider that, uh, that material reality is non-existent, it's really only energy. Sir James Jeans, the great physicist, looking into that particular question, said it's beginning to look very suspicious, as if the whole universe may be just made of mind stuff. Well, what's mind stuff? Consciousness. When you, and this is a question that I think brings everybody to the path sooner or later, they think, well, last night I dreamed something, and it seemed very real. And when I woke up, it, it wasn't. How do I know that the life I'm living right now isn't a dream? And in fact, there is a certain dream-like quality to everything. Can you remember what you were thinking five minutes ago? If you can say yes, I'll be surprised. <coughs> Many times people in the midst of some great tragedy or crisis or difficulty, I must be dreaming. I remember one time, it was a funny experience for me, I would found myself flying. And I thought, well, people don't fly. It doesn't make sense. Maybe I'm dreaming. So I went through a long line of logic to decide whether I was dreaming or awake. And I finally concluded that I was awake. I was just doing something very unusual. <laughs> what was my surprise when I woke up a moment later? Well, that's what the experience of God consciousness and awakening in Him is. We suddenly wake up and we see that this whole thing is just a dream. Now, these are beautiful theories philosophically, but the marvelous thing was living with someone who proved that it was a dream. And the things that he wrote about, you know, when I read Autobiography of the Yogi, I was a pretty skeptical young man at the time. I'd had no exposure to... Uh, anything of this nature. I remember my mother talking about the miracles that saints had performed, and I just, <laughs> I wouldn't even talk about it. It seemed too ridiculous. And a brother of mine um, was talking about reincarnation. I said, oh, come on. I couldn't accept it at all. But when I lived with Yogananda, when I came to him, there was so much in the man, in his vision of life that was true, that rang true with everything I really knew from my actual experience to be so, that I thought, I can't accept that somebody can live several hundred years. I can't accept page eight, Lahiri Marshai materializing in a wheat field. But I accept him. Okay, I'll put these doubts on a shelf. When I say I had doubts, I had plenty of doubts. I had to sit down every 15 minutes and just calm my mind because it was such a whirlwind of questions, and I drove everybody nuts with my questions. <laughs> but I knew in my heart that one thing, that he was true. He knew what he was talking about, and I never saw him ever step down off that pedestal. He never put himself on it, but he never, he never changed suits. He was always what you saw, completely genuine, completely loving, completely enjoy all the things that he talked about. And then I began to see things that were absolutely astounding to me. I mean, okay, I've told this story before, and it's, a, it's an amazing story to me. One time, I had to go to a, a bar mitzvah. I'm not Jewish, but they had invited me to, us, I should say, to come and demonstrate the yoga postures um, in Beverly Hills. Well, I don't know why they did, but we did. And uh, Beverly Hills, is, especially the Jews in Beverly Hills, a whole bunch of psychiatrists, <laughs> and, <clears throat> all of them atheists and absolute skeptics. Now, maybe there are exceptions to this. I don't know. <laughs> and this psychiatrist got me in a corner, and he started challenging the things that we believe. And I tried to bring in some of the things that I'd experienced with Master, well, you know, I was naive. I could just think of him now in retrospect, 
sort of thinking, well, let's see, I have on Wednesday time for an appointment with this crazy fellow. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't buy it at all. Of course he wouldn't. He wasn't, re he wasn't ready for it. And uh, here's the th uh, thing that astounded me, was that a couple of days later, Master often, when he had guests, he would have me serve them dinner, and then I would do the postures. And then after the guests left, I would sit there with Master, and we'd talk a little bit. And uh, sometimes it was quite trivial. One trivial episode was rather fun. Um, don't think that a Master isn't human. There was a fork on the table, and he kept going like this to the fork and making it leap. <laughs> Finally, it did what he was trying to do, go into the glass, broke the glass. <laughs> you think, well, a master wouldn't break the glass. <laughs> and uh, he looked at me impishly. He said, but I got it in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, on this occasion, he said, by the way, when you're with the skeptics, materialists, don't talk about miracles. Well, I just had come from that experience. I knew that that uh, psychiatrists didn't have a pipeline about Washington. And I, I was surprised. I said, you knew about it. His answer astounded me. He said, I know every thought you think. And he showed it to me on repeated occasions that even the little ways, some little thought that I had in meditation that wasn't right, he would, I remember one time, a little one, I said, help me to love you as you love me. And he looked at me afterwards when I was with him with a group of people. He looked at me and he said, how can the cup hold the whole ocean? I knew what he meant. How can I love him as he loves me? He's loving me with infinite love. Divine love is not personal. He was very personal toward us as us, but he wasn't personal in himself. It was God loving us and helping us to understand that it was God loving God. This whole show is not you and me. It's an infinite spectacle of God playing all these roles, each one of us, is playing a certain role. And you may think, oh, well, but how dull it would be if we all knew that he was doing it all. No! He's so incredibly infinite and varied in his thinking. Each person is unique. You are unique. There will never be another you. There's a song that was that many years ago. It's the truth. No one will ever be who you are. You should take yourself seriously. But on the other hand, you shouldn't take yourself seriously as, huh, me, like that. <laughs> like another Mussolini, let's say. No. It's that he has a different part to play through everyone. And because people get in the way and think, me, he can't act properly. He'd love to play. When we had people playing so beautifully last night. If they had thought, well, I'm up here performing, there'd have been a sour note. There was not a sour note because everybody, there was one sour note. <laughs> I'll have to talk to Jeannie about that one. <clears throat> I think the sour note was mine. I've got to check one note in one of those melodies. <clears throat> <laughs> <coughs> Maybe I wrote it wrong, anyway. <laughs> the thing is that when you're in tune, everything that you do, just it's harmonious. Everything that you do, is, it's joyful. You don't really even have to do anything. You know that beautiful story of St. Anthony of the Desert, when he was invited by the Archbishop of, Alexa of Alexandria, I guess, to come and defend the church because there had come this Arian heresy which said that Jesus is a man instead of uh, a son of God. Um, he came to try to help. He was invited to give a lecture. Well, he'd been in seclusion for something like 75 years or so. 
he wasn't very used to speaking. <laughs> and uh, when he came into the town, people saw him walking. And just in his walk, there was something so dignified, so authoritative, so powerful, that everybody flocked to the church to hear what he had to say. And they started in on the Nicene Creed, and I believe in uh, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and so on. And at this point, Arians in the crowd began objecting. And suddenly, in the midst of this Sunday service, there was this big squabble. Anthony stood up, and all he said was four words, I have seen him. Now, you get the average person who says, I have seen him. Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. You're not going to believe him. But he said it with such conviction that he, he didn't have to say anything more. Now, when Jesus was faulting Martha for being too restless, he was saying, not don't work. He was saying, work with consciousness. And when you can work with consciousness, somehow everything that you do will express that consciousness. Everything that you do well, in some way, just walking down the street made people feel that Anthony had something they wanted to hear about. Some woman told me years ago that she had been outside a restaurant and she just happened, she didn't know who Master was. She just happened to see him through the window. She turned to her husband. She said, I, that is the most spiritual man I've ever seen. How could it be? Same eyes, same nose, same mouth, dark skin, okay, but basically the same as everybody else. There's an aura in who you are, in what you do, that is far more important than that which you do. And so it is that I've come to learn that it isn't even Saying a thing clearly, exactly, in a scholarly way doesn't mean a thing. I've been to lectures in Italy where this, the trend seems to be <coughs> <coughs> that any lecture you give, you read. Well, it's so boring. Talk from your heart. Talk with your spirit. Master said, give people your vibrations. Don't just give them intellectual. Don't be a DD. What's that? Doctor of Divinity? No, he meant Doctor of Delusion. <laughs> Don't be like that. Be attuned to God. And whatever you do, feel that attunement and work from that attunement. And know that you don't really and can't really do anything except to the extent that He empowers you. And then you will see that somehow this world will change. It won't change with peace treaties. It won't change with new laws. And it won't change with learned treatises that nobody reads as to the need for peace. And it certainly won't change with all these peace marches where people march so angrily trying to bring peace and yet being angry with people who don't agree with them. What kind of teaching is that? We have to live what we are, what we believe, we have to live it in our lives, and that can only come by meditation. And so the Marthas and the Marys are both necessary. You can't have the right spirit if you don't get into the spirit. And you act from ego consciousness. It's evident in people's eyes where their consciousness is. The eyes are the window of the soul. And if you can live in that divine joy and peace, that is what will radiate. And it will radiate in everything that you do. You remember uh, what I said last Sunday, those of you who were here, even in cooking, the vibrations you put into your cooking are very important. You know, I had a very interesting experience when I was a monk in Mount, in Mount Washington, at Mount Washington, and uh, it was a Christmas dinner, and I was helping the boys to cook this dinner. And uh, 
It was a very joyous occasion somehow because it was Christmas and so we were chanting and singing to God as we cooked and that chanting and that vibration got into the food. Well, I'll tell you what happened afterwards. I, it was so good. Everybody was laughing at how much I ate. I ate, not like a pig, no, but I ate. <laughs> and you'd think that after eating so much that I would be too heavy to be able to meditate well. I had one of the best meditations I'd had in months. And at night I dreamed of angels singing, Oh God, beautiful, and I woke up to that all because of those vibrations. Listen, when you cook for people, you're putting vibrations into the food. It's very important. But in everything that you do, when you write letters to people, put those vibrations. I've learned in writing that I can put vibrations into words, that it's not just arranging them in a sensible way. The vibration is partly the rhythm. In many little ways, the color of a sound, the color of a word, that's why I'll go over a thing maybe 50 times so that people will finally read it and say, oh, you write so easily. I try to make it read easily, but the process of writing is not easy. And yet with music, it does come easily because there's not the same level of, of mentation. And so I just ask God and there it is. It's, I, don't, I, don't, I can't take credit for any of this. He is really the doer. But you'll see that the more, don't passively allow him to do it, he won't do it. Just like a lecture of mine years ago in Hollywood Church, I thought, well, Master said we should let God speak through us. So maybe what I should do is just stop and let him speak. So I stopped. But you figure, that's been five seconds. Two minutes I stood there. Ananda Moy told me he was perspiring, <laughs> thinking I'd frozen. No, I was perfectly comfortable. I was just waiting for God to say something. <clears throat> Finally realized it doesn't work that way. He's not going to do it for me. I have to do it. As Master said, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity in everything that we do, that I do. And I've seen again and again that when I haven't known what to do, instead of sitting there sort of paralyzed, thinking, God, show me, show me, I just say, all right, well, roll up my sleeves and dig in, and then the understanding begins to come. You'll see that if you don't hold back timidly and say, well, God, how can you use me? Why shouldn't he use you? You're just as much a part of him as the greatest master who ever lived. And I should add to that that there's never been a greatest master. They're all one in him. There's no great or small. But God can come through you to the extent that you allow him to. One time one of my fellow disciples, Bernard, master was telling him to do something and Bernard kept balking and finally said, well, master, you can do it. You're a master. Master thundered his response. He said, what do you think made me a master? It's by doing. When you meditate, don't think, oh, well, this is a big joke. You know, here I am. There you are. I'm certainly no Jesus Christ. Just think, I'm your child, God. You've got to come to me. And if you don't come today, well, come tomorrow. But the more you live in the consciousness that he's with you and that everything you do can express that more and more. <coughs> there are many people who say, well, I shouldn't do anything until I feel divine guidance. What I've learned from my poor years of struggle on the path, and really these years are very few. To those who are younger, they seem long. To me, uh, I look back when I was four years old, same old fellow. <laughs> when you look back, you begin to see, well, I have learned, however, a few lessons. One thing I've learned is this, that I just have to do my best and give the results to God, yes. Don't get excited about it, it just doesn't matter. I always used to think that I'm, I'm nowhere when it comes to writing music because all the musicians and musical people I met are really into music, I'm not. To me, I could write it or not write it, it just doesn't matter. 
<coughs> in fact, the same thing with communities, with books. Nothing that I've done is important to me. And I, I've all, I used to think, well, how can it be good if it's not important to you? But I realized that making it important is an obstacle. <coughs> Do your best, that's all that matters. If you can really do your best at even the least thing that you're doing, it will shine. It will have an influence. I remember there was a, a woman at Mount Washington. She was uh, Mrs. Merck. I believe she was the wife of the Merck Pharmaceutical. So she'd been a very wealthy person at one time. She was just a very humble devotee. She was Swedish. And... Uh, she used to talk of the flowers as her children. And it just, uh, there was nothing, uh, no sense of I've come from an important place, just serving God in the flowers. And she made a beautiful garden. Whatever you do, if you, if you think that way, talk to the flowers, talk to your everything. It's all conscious. This is the wonderful thing about this universe. As Master said in his poem, Samadhi, all flowing I, I everywhere, joy everywhere. He is that I in you. And the only thing that makes ego wrong is that you limit it. And you think, huh, I, putting yourself against and above other people. No, it's the same I. That one self manifests itself through all of us. When we can know that self and not this little ego, when we aren't attached to anything, we realize it's all his show. Then what you do becomes a joy. Actually, I think the most important moral value is freedom. If when you act, you can act in freedom, you're acting in the divine way. Master acted in freedom two or three times. He was sent by God to America to start a great work, to write these books. Two or three times he said, Divine Mother, I don't want it anymore. And he just set out to leave it and just be with God. Each time God brought him back. But he wasn't attached to anything. And I remember one time we'd been needing somebody in the print shop. I said to him, Sir, we found a printer to come and live there. He very indignantly said, why do you say that? First ask if they have our spirit, then see where they'll fit. Where you are isn't important, it's your spirit. There was a center leader in Montreal, and we'd been needing somebody, and he was a very capable fellow. So I suggested to Master, I said, he would be wonderful here, he's doing good work in Montreal. Master's answer was, if he's doing good work in Montreal, why bring him here? <laughs> where you are doesn't matter. It's where your consciousness is. If you can feel more and more that he is acting through you, and it's his work, it isn't important. The, only, the last and only time I really thought of this work as mine here was one time about 25 years ago. I was walking in Ayodhya, and there were all these trailers uh, that's all people had to live in in those days. And there were these lights in the trailers. And I thought, well, a few years ago there wasn't anything. And now there are these beautiful lights and people there living. And I thought, I did this. I thought I didn't like that feeling. It made me feel small. So I thought, no, God, it's you who did it. And I felt free again. So since then, I've never allowed that thought to come in because every time... It tries to come in and say, well, you are the doer. I find that it makes me small. If you say, he did it, you're released from this little obligation. I mean, gosh, if you did it, then you owe it to your public to do it better all the time. <laughs> the heck with it. Just do what you can. <laughs> Be free. Enjoy. Do it in God's joy. This is the teaching of Martha and Mary, that it was perfectly fine for her to eat, to cook, I mean, but she should have done it with Mary's consciousness. She should have done it with the thought of joy. 
And when you work, put your whole soul into your work. Don't just say, well, one man told me up in Vancouver many years ago, he was a wealthy man, but he wanted to reassure me that his values were elsewhere. And he said that, well, I have to do that at the office, but when I come home, my real life begins. When I can change into other clothes, close my door and meditate. And I thought, what a pity to waste the whole day. All that you do can be for God. Why separate the two? In your office, in your kitchen, in your work of all kinds, in the fields, everything can be for God if you have that attitude. Contemplation doesn't mean just sitting down and chanting Om. Contemplation means feeling His energy flowing through you. That's one of the beautiful things about the energization exercises that they help us to feel that energy as we move our bodies and tense our muscles. That same thing that we learn through energization, we need to project into everything that we do. So that when you talk to people, when you mix with people, put your vibrations into it. And you will find that that, more than anything else, is what can and I believe will change the world.